Thanks. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here um, among such esteemed researchers. Um, I'm surprised to hear a little bit from um, uh, Professor Mori's talk that uh, he, this conception that his um, there was a rediscovery of his ideas only two years ago because in the humanities, in the field of visual and performance arts, we've been talking about your essay and your work for, for much longer than that. So it didn't lie dormant for that entire period. Uh, I can say that with certainty from the humanities. So I'm a theater artist and I spend a lot of time thinking about what makes things uncanny. As a theater artist, I make puppets, I direct plays, and I also research the influence of robotics and animatronics and how they're changing the nature of live performance. Now this scares a lot of humanists out there. Uh, some people in the humanities think that I'm suggesting that somehow robots are going to replace human actors. Well, just as puppets never replaced human actors and we have two very different types of, of performing arts that sort of look uh, very different from one another. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen anytime soon, but I am deeply interested in the challenges and also the opportunities that are created for new types of performances and new types of interfaces uh, that are made available by entertainment robots. Now, it, the uncanny may be something that uh, people who build robots uh, want to avoid, but artists are genuinely really fond of provoking the uncanny. Uh, it's a response that we often try to evoke in artworks and performances. And part of this happens because artists know that the work of art exists in the real world, but it also exists in the imagination of the spectator. Because artworks enable us to rehearse both our anxieties and desires concerning new technologies. And they prompt reflections about what makes us human. This was true of the 18th century automata by Vaucasson that sought to demonstrate scientific principles and understanding of the human body through very realistic uh, and uh, very similar behaviors in the automatons. It was also true of the Bunraku theater of the same period of uh, Vaucasson's automata where audiences would flock to Bunraku shows to see these very sophisticated hands that could uh, that could approximate very fine detailed motions um, such as threading a needle or pouring tea with the same refinement as human motions and the kabuki actors of the time. Now because artists are interested in provoking the uncanny, uh, Professor Mori's essay has become incredibly useful uh, for us in the art world as a way of thinking about issues of representation and when considering works that deliberately challenge the distinction between the living and the dead, the animate and the inanimate, or between the real and the hyper-real. And this is an example of, uh, in sculpture, admittedly sculptures that aren't, aren't moving, but uh, Ron Mooks and Dwayne Hansen's work both um, sort of exaggerate and distort the human form with an exaggerated clarity that it, it throws the humanity into a type of relief. And it really prompts a reflection about the nature between surface and depth sort of, even though these are, are all surface sculptures that don't move, they do suggest a kind of liveliness or presence. Now, another approach is to deliberately exploit or parody popular conceptualizations of robots, and the work of Kenji uh, Yonobe, uh, a Japanese artist, explores this very well, his Queen Mama, uh, and the seven-meter-tall, fire-breathing uh, giant Torian that was featured not far from here a few years ago. Um, these figures are both sort of ominous and incredibly playful at the same time. And there's, they, they provoke the uncanny in a way that prompts sort of reflection on past technologies and invites us to imagine sort of future, and, uh, future technologies as well. We also see the uncanny in works that are not anthropomorphic and that don't necessarily feature human shapes. Seiko Mikami's Desire of Codes combines, this was featured at Ars Electronica, she combines robotic technologies with sensing technologies and uh, live visual surveillance data in an effort to mimic the processes of human memory, exploring the ambiguities between technology and human faculties. Uh, other examples are Louis-Philippe de Mea's Blind Robot, which investigates the uncanny nature of human-robot interaction through a staged, sort of almost a, a dramatized physical encounter. And, uh, as well as Daniel Frank and Cedric Kiefer's unnamed sound sculpture, we have a sense of the uncanny here. I encourage you to look at the video uh, if you can on YouTube. But it's a moving video, but it suggests how the, uh, we can have the sense of the uncanny that can be provoked even when there's not a body, right? Even when we're just looking at the technologically mediated body of performance. 
Uh, and lastly, another work uh, by uh, an artist who's a friend of mine, Zavin Pahe, who combines uh, the work of digital puppetry together with um, robotics in his art installations. And on the more popular front, uh, Creature Technology Company is a Melbourne-based theater company that's working with what I know as the most advanced animatronics. They're trying to adapt animated films for live performance. Turns out this is very difficult to do. Uh, but their recent production of King Kong uh, that was uh, premiered in 2013 combined robotic control techniques with direct manipulation puppetry. So there was an automated marionette system to control the six meter tall, one ton robot. Uh, and it was also combined with direct manipulation in this traditional style of bunarku. So actually puppeteers inside of the hands of King Kong. This was the most graceful, moving, compelling performance by a one ton robot I've ever seen. Um, so all of these works uh, in some way address the very issues uh, and articulate the same points that Mori raises in, in Professor Mori raises in his article. Um, and that is, they question purposefully the nature of representation, they question the relationship between an object's surface and its movement, and what kind of a response this provokes in the spectator. And if we concede that robots are, uh, have aesthetic properties, they function aesthetically like works of art, then we might be able to apply the insights from the aesthetics of visual and performance art and that may help us to create robots that are uh, interesting and compelling as performers. So, thank you.